spring break is not over. We're just going to talk for 75 minutes. Okay, how's it going? So the exam is coming. Here it is. The exam, uh, if you want to know what's on the exam, remember the good old schedule. Here it is. The individual sections. It's from here to here. We didn't talk about bioelectricity. I'm going to talk about bioelectricity today. Is it on the exam? No, there's nothing here. We're talking about bioelectricity because it's interesting and because there'll be a few calculations we do that are useful and illustrative of the things you need to know for the exam. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how your body works and then, I mean, you know, just on the surface, and then uh, a little bit about magnetism. So we'll do a little bit and then we'll be pretty much caught up. So this week, magnetism, and then we'll do half a lecture of exam review Friday, just a few practice problems, or thir uh, Thursday, whatever. A few practice problems. Okay, so your main source of what's on the exam is here. If you want to do practice problems, at the end of the chapter, it actually breaks the problems down by section, right? So if there's one section you feel like, I'm not very good at this, just go do the problems in the back of the book in that section. That'd probably be the, a good way to review also. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. I'll do brief questions about the exam while I transition. Any, it's going to be like every other exam we've had. General, yeah. Magnetism, I need you to say, will there be magnetic fields on the exam? That has to be the question. Will there be magnetic fields? Yes, the Earth's magnetic field will be on the exam. There's nothing I can do about that. Thank you, we're back. Uh, no, magnetism will not be on the exam. The Earth's magnetic field will be on the exam. So the exam only covers two here. It does not cover what you did that week. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want it on the exam, yes. Yes, answer all three free responses, because they'll be easier that way. They won't, we won't make them as long and hard. All right, yeah, so it'll be just like the last exam. Okay, so that means we're moving on to uh, cover bioelectricity. Here we go. I missed you guys so much, I really did. I missed you so much that a few times I stood in front of a mirror and said, do I need to know this? I missed you that much. Is that weird? I was also crying and eating donuts while I did it, is that? And I was naked, is that? Okay. Not weird, okay. Okay. Oh yeah, so I was gonna do one, uh, one reminder, since it was a long break, one reminder of capacitor circuits, RC circuits. So Dr. Stenson did this at the end, but it's worth a reminder, let's charge and discharge a capacitor. This is the one kind of time dependent circuit that we're doing, right? Charge and discharge a capacitor. Um, so I'm gonna draw the circuit with a switch. It's useful to use switches. If you've looked at the homework, so you notice I like to do them with switches because it lets you kind of think about uh, both cases. So a switch is just a little thing that goes back and forth and it can touch one electrode or touch the other electrode. So this could be a circuit with a switch. We can switch it here, we can switch it up there, and then it might go to a capacitor and then a resistor. So this would be the kind of circuit you would use to look at charging and discharging a, uh, oh wait, that doesn't look right. <laughs> charging and discharging a, a capacitor. There we go, that looks better. All right. So we're not going to go through the whole thing. You set up uh, Kirchhoff's rules and you solve them and it's a differential equation. Technically you have to integrate it. I don't know what level you did that, but I know we don't like calculus. So I'm just going to go to the answer because we did it last time. So you charge a capacitor. You know that this is the po positive end. Remember the positive end is the one with the long plate. I don't know if I told you that before. This is literally the pile of plates in the electrochemical cell is what that represents. So the long one is positive, the short one's negative. So current would flow out of here and start to charge up this plate. And we worked out the equation for the time dependence of the charge on that plate. And we said that Q is a function of time is whatever it's going to get to, Q naught, times 1 minus E to the minus T over RC. Which looks like a weird form. That's just the equation for something exponentially approaching a value, starting at 0 and approaching a value. So if you plot that, get out your calculator and plot it, you would say there's, there's Q naught on this Q axis, there's time, and it has this shape that looks like this. 
right? So it's going to a limiting value of Q naught. It'll get there at infinity. And you can actually convince yourself that this looks like this because this is like, if it were exponential to decay, it'd look like that, right? And if you invert it, it looks like that. And then if you take one minus that, it looks like that. You can convince yourself that this little formula makes a shape that does that rather than going to infinity. Why doesn't current go through the battery if it flows from positive to negative? Did I say current doesn't flow through a battery before? Oh, that sounds familiar. I don't know. Uh, current flows here, and it flows here, and it flows here. Whether or not current flows through a battery is a, is a philosophical question. I would need a more specific uh, case where you really need to know. But that's a philosophical question. Depends on what's happening in the battery. OK, we can also, so which, so quick mental quiz, which state of the switch is going to charge? Yes, up here where it's touching the battery, right? So there it's charging because the current can actually flow through the switch. Now we want to discharge it, to bring it down here. So now the battery is doing nothing. If you see a battery in a circuit and one electrode isn't touching anything, that battery is not doing anything, right? It can't send any current anywhere, right? So in this case, all that's going to happen now is this charge is going to come off the capacitor and discharge through the resistor. Now, why did it stay on before? It stayed on before because the battery held this plate at this high potential and this plate at the low potential. That's why it stayed on before. Now the battery isn't doing that for it. So the charge will say, oh, I'd rather come around here. Right? So that's discharge. All right, and Q is a function of time. It's just Q naught e to the minus t over RC. So it's just exponential decay, which we'll talk about more later, exponential decay. So the main way we would mix these up in problems, like you saw it on the homework, I mean, I think, I think exactly what I did on the homework is a switch like this, and you say you charge it up through R, but when you discharge it, there's another resistor here. Right? So what if we put another resistor? How would it all change if we put a resistor there? Well, the charge wouldn't care. The charge rate would be the same because the current doesn't flow through that resistor, right? Because this is just going up to nothing, right? So there you go. So the charge would be this formula, but the discharge, it would now just be going through two resistors in series, if they're both R, and the sum of those two resistors in series is just 2R. So you would just put a 2 right there. Right? So this is a circuit where it charges at one rate and it discharges at a different rate because it sees different resistances in the two circuits. And then there's infinite ways we can get more complicated, but then the formulas get more complicated. You can't just use these two. So pretty much the only way we can use these two to make it more complicated is just maybe add in some more resistors in various ways. Ooh, what if we did that? Ooh, right? Things like that, okay? So I just wanted to remind you that's, that's the only sort of time-dependent circuit that we've done so far is charge and discharge. The other thing you'll see in the homework is questions like, how long does it take it to get to half its maximum charge? For those, you just say half its maximum charge, 0 0.5 Q naught equals Q naught. Oh my God, they didn't tell me Q naught, but you don't need it. You see, it's going to cancel out. Whenever you're asked to get how long to get to a fraction of, a cer of the total of the maximum, you just write the fraction of the maximum and you see that, oh, I don't need the, the maximum. And then you can just figure out <coughs> what is T. So there's, there's one like that in the homework as well. So those are the main kinds of, <coughs> those kinds of problems that you do. Okay. Little charge and discharge circuits. Okay. Let's see, one thing I want to tell you about all this stuff is uh, this guy that you heard about last time. Kirk, Kurt, did uh, Dr. Sinson say Kirchhoff or Kirchhoff? Kirchhoff, probably. The Americanized version, yes. Um, I don't have time to answer that now. Uh, we're obviously too busy here. Kirchhoff uh, was the German guy that invented all this, but I have a conspiracy theory. He's the same person as Walt Whitman. It's actually the same guy, okay? They were born about the same time. They died about the same time. And uh, Kirchhoff would be over in Germany working on circuits, and then he'd come over to the U.S. and, like, live in the forest and write dirty poems about shrubbery or whatever it was that Whitman did, okay? I'm pretty sure they're the same guy. You can make, like, a drinking game out of it, Kirchhoff or Whitman. And the reason it's relevant now is because Whitman... He gave it up, he gave away his identity when he wrote this poem, I Sing the Body Electric. So Whitman knows that the body is an electric machine. All right? I love Whitman because everything you read, it's like, I think this is dirty, but he's going so fast that you don't have time to decide. You know? 
The armies of those I love engirth me, and I engirth them. They will not let me off till I... Wait, what? I don't know. Let's just keep going. What is he talking about? Of course, he was the one that discovered that the body was electric, even though he was actually a physicist in Germany. Uh, it was long, known for a long time, a Galvani, you know, putting a battery on frog legs and they twitch. And lots of sick stuff happened that you don't hear about too much. Like here was a demo they used to do for fun at carnivals. You know, let's just cut off a bunch of cow heads and attach batteries to them and make their tongues like come out and, and wiggle around and stuff, right? So this has been known and used for entertainment for a long time. Put that on your YouTube channel there. And uh, it's known, but now we're going to talk in the details of uh, how it works. How can we think of how the body's bioelectricity works in terms of this simple concept to help us do a few practice calculations? Um, I have one other conspiracy theory that I do have to show because I'm big into them. There we go. Those are the same person as well. I have seen them both in concert, and they make the same face. Okay? So you are... You have to be a very specific age to know those two, who both of those people are. You have to be exactly 47. Uh, you are an electrical machine. You are an electrical machine, but you're ionic rather than electronic. But ionic rather than electronic. So we talk about in circuits, usually, we mean electrons moving through metals. Uh, I said metal right when I wrote that letter. <clears throat> but of course, you can also have ions moving in a solution, and that's basically how you work, right? So you're, uh, in an, you're an ionic circuit. Everything about you is basically on a, an ionic circuit. The fundamental structure that we care about that makes all this work and that I do research on, therefore it is the most important one, is the lipid bilayer, right? So here's your cell, right? Here's the nucleus. Whatever those are, there's the powerhouse, whatever bullshit that is, right? And then now let's zoom in on the membrane, okay? The lipid bilayer membrane that makes it all work. It's got these like head groups like this and two little hydrocarbon fatty acid acyl chains like that, right? There's the membrane. And it goes off in 2D like this. Here we're looking at it sort of in cross section, right? There's your lipid bilayer membrane. Hello. I thought I was being approached. Okay. So if we zoom in on one of these molecules, it looks like this. It's made out of lipids. Fat. All right. We are fundamentally fat. This head group has like a choline group and a phosphate and some glycerols, and it likes water. All right. We say it's hydrophilic, and this hates water. We say it's hydrophobic. So when you throw these molecules in water, they aren't soluble, and they arrange into this kind of structure, this lipid bilayer structure. It's about, we'll say, seven nanometers thick. It depends on how much of the molecules you include, right? And it holds, uh, it separates the water or the solutions inside the cell from the solutions outside the cell. And it's not just the wall of the cell. It's every, it's the nucleus. It's the, all the, you know, all the little organelles. They all have membranes. Pretty much everything happens at the membrane. When a molecule does this, when it half likes water and half hates water, you can say one of two things, and they mean the same thing. You can say it's amphipathic, or you can say it's amphiphilic. Same definition, right? Amphiphilic means it loves both things. It loves water, and it loves oil. So if you think the world is based on love, you would say it's amphiphilic, okay? Amphipathic means it submits to both things. It hates both things. It suffers both things. So if you feel that's how the world works, you say it's amphipathic. Okay, lipids are amphipathic. It is the Latin amphipathic, not the Greek pathic. We won't get into that, but it generally, we, whatever. Okay. Um, so what this does electrically, I've told you nothing electrical. What does it do? It's the insulator, right? So the lipid membrane uh, blocks the flow of ions, which is your current, right? So it's basically your insulator that you need. Otherwise, you don't really have much of an of electrical circuit happening in your body. You don't have any insulators. In a real circuit, in a metal circuit, the insulator is the air. You know, the electrons can't leave the wire and go into the air. So it's kind of like your air, okay? Let's see, so we're all set up. 
We've got our resistors, we got all this. How are we gonna turn this into a body? Let's see. This won't take long. Let's just describe all of molecular physiology. Uh, so the way this works electrically is that the uh, you can get a membrane, a lipid membrane potential difference. So a delta V, just like the delta V in your nine volt battery, you can have one, you have them across your cell membrane, okay? And you get it from differences in ion concentration. From different ion concentrations. So we'll draw this. Ion concentrations. All right, so if we have our lipid bile, I'll draw it sideways now, head group, little tails, like that. Typical oversimplification of the world here, like that. You could say, well, you're gonna have a bunch of, or let's get a bunch of sodium ions on this side. All right, and not so many over here. So even uh, with our just basic understanding of electrostatics, you might guess the potential is probably higher here than it is here. You're a lot closer to a bunch of charges here than you are over here. So if we were gonna draw the potential as a function of position, all right, it'd be high over here, the ion density is constant, nice and high, and then it's gonna be low over here, all right? So in between, it just goes down like that. Of course, I drew it at a really low, oh, you can see it, okay. So all that is, that's the potential difference. So the delta V here, how much it drops, is about 50 millivolts, okay? So the voltages in your body are not big. They're sort of tens of millivolts scale. All your cells, all your uh, organelles in your cells, all their action occurs because we have little potential differences across the membrane. So let's do some calculations on this lipid membrane, uh, similar to the ones you might do on the exam. And let's calculate its resistance for some typical cell. So let's see, what will we get? Membrane resistance to current flow. And of course we mean to ionic current flow, but all the formulas are the same. All right, so let's say we have a cell that is uh, 50 microns in diameter, which is kind of big, but I'm trying to follow a book's example. I would have gone a little smaller than that. And remember the membrane is seven nanometers thick. So this thing, you know, the, the thickness is really small compared uh, to the height. Therefore, what you do is you treat it as a flat sheet. As a sheet like this. So we just bend it down into like a, just a big square like that. And we say the area, look at that aspect ratio. Look at the area of uh, this, or that, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, is four pi r squared, All right? Where well, there's r. So we're just flattening it out, not worrying about the edges. And then the thickness here is seven nanometers. So we just gotta go to our formula for the resistance of anything. We only gave you one formula for resistance, so that's probably the one you're gonna use, is rho L over A. The resistance R is rho L over A. And that was for a cylinder, but really that's for any elongated object. Uh, it's, so it's elongated along the direction of the current flow for any shape cross section, and it doesn't have to be really long. So the cylinder, in this case, the length is just seven nanometers and the area is this big area. So it's not really a cylinder, like an elongated cylinder, it's like a short squat square cylinder is how we're applying it. So R, uh, the resistance then is rho, that's that resistivity in ohm meters. You look it up in a table. Yes, we'll give you any one of them that you're gonna need on the exam. 36 times 10 to the six ohm meters. I remember when you look on that table, like metals are really low, like copper is something 10 to the minus eight. And silica, or glass is really high, I don't know, 10 to the 14 or something. So lipids are a pretty good resistor, 10 to the six uh, to ion flow. Uh, L is seven nanometers, seven times 10 to the minus nine meters. And uh, A is area that, the surface area, four pi r squared, 2.5 times 10 to the minus five meters squared. There you go. 
So that'll be an actual resistance uh, to ion flow. And you get 32 mega ohms. Look at that. You're just a 32 mega ohm resistor, every one of your cells. That's how I think of you. Bless you. Well, that's the resistance. Let's do the capacitance. That was so fun. Let's do the capacitance now. It's a little more exciting. So the capacitor, I mean, you'd say, is this really a capacitor? What was a capacitor again? A capacitor is really just two conductors next to each other. And you say, how much charge does it take to make up a certain potential? Or adding a certain potential pulls in how much charge? Same idea. So the two conductors in this case really are the electrolyte, the free ions on inside the cell, and the free ions outside the cell. So really the geometry you're thinking about is the geometry of the insulator. Okay, so let's get the membrane capacitance for the same geometry. Membrane capacitance. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna say, well, let's just treat it roughly as this big patch like this. And it's all the same. This is still the area uh, L over D. We usually call this D when we write the capacitance formula. So the capacitance, we just go to a formula we did before for a parallel plate capacitor. Because we're thinking of this as a parallel, you know, two plates really close together. The inside and the outside are kind of like two flat plates. They're not really flat plates, but this is 25 microns and this is only seven nanometers. So if you get really close to this surface, it basically looks like a flat plate. So that's how we can approximate it as this. And you go to your capacitance formula, which will be on the exam on the formula sheet, uh, the diametric constant, uh, permittivity of free space, uh, the area over the, uh, the, disc, the thickness. So we start plugging and chugging here. So for the oily inside of lipid bilayer, it's like nine. Sounds kind of high, doesn't it? Well, biomolecules are very polarizable, so that's why it's kind of high. Oil is like two, but lipid bilayer, because it's a lipid and it's polarizable, it's higher, nine. Uh, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Permittivity of free space. Um, the area is the same area we did up above. Four pi 25 microns squared. Somebody was just asking. Where did you get the equation for R squared? Shouldn't the area of a circle be pi R squared? Oh, it's the area of a sphere, though. This whole thing's a sphere. So we're doing the area of the sphere. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> and then over D, seven nanometers. All right, so boop, 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 plug it in, and you get 89 picofarads. And you say, 89 picofarads? That's really small. Why is it so small? It's only a seven nanometer gap, but it's teeny, right? It's very small plates. So you should feel lucky that it's 89 picofarads. Ungrateful. Let's see. So now we have R and C. So that's exciting. What do you do when you have R and C? I mean, this is literally, I'm giving you a hint on the exam. If you have R, not that I've read the actual problems, but you have an R and a C, that usually means you're looking for a time constant, right? Because in that circuit, what tells you how fast this happens is the product of R and C, right? So we're not gonna redo all this old lecture stuff, but we call this tau the time constant, right? So if you change this value RC under the time variable in the equation like this, it affects how fast it goes. If uh, it's really low, then it goes, or if it's really small, RC is small, then this will be like really fast. And if RC is really big, oh, it'll take forever. So that's the time constant we're talking about. So now we can actually calculate the time constant of the membrane of a cell, it's pretty exciting, or something you know similar to a cell. So here we go, got our cell like this, we calculated its R, we calculated its C, and we could say tau is RC. Okay. So many, how'd you get 8.85 to the minus 12 again? That's the permittivity of free space. You only pronounce one of the T's, but I like to pronounce both T's. It helps me remember how to spell it. RC, so 32 mega ohms times 89 picofarads is uh, 2.8 milliseconds. Ooh, that sounds pretty fast, right? Oh my gosh, let's see. Why is tau RC? It's defined as RC. Hold on, here you go. Anxiety, 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 anxiety. Oh, now you feel good. 
That just means I defined it as. Three bars means it's a definition. Okay, whatever, okay. <clears throat> just got back, got me some slack. Uh, 2.8 milliseconds. That sounds fast. Think of how fast your brain is. Wow, things are firing at 2.8 milliseconds. Okay, let's do a demonstration. I need to move, oh God. I need to move my foot. Somebody shout now and I'll move my foot instantly at a random time, shout now. No. Look at that, look how fast I move my foot. Should that have been possible? Let's draw me here. In my mind, I'm two meters tall. Okay, wait a minute. No, I'm not two meters tall. Okay, so for that to work, then you had to send a signal down these cells from one to the other to the other to the other. So how many cells tall am I? If they're 50 micron cells, it's two meters over 0. 0.00005 uh, per whatever. And uh, I'm 40,000 cells tall. Okay, that, those are big cells. So that's how tall I am. Cells. I'm a replicant. Okay, so if we had to wait for um, this to jump from here to here to here to here to here to here, so from head to toe, it would be 40,000 in this simple model of how uh, signals would go down your body. This cell uh, makes some sort of jump, but he has to wait for it to finish, and then this cell, and then this cell, and this cell, and this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell and you get 112 seconds. Right, so that seems a little slow. Okay. So clearly, uh, just cells having their natural RC component and transmitting signals to each other can't be how it works. Except sloths. This is how sloths' um, uh, nervous system works. But the rest of us have active components. And the reason is this is just passive. This is not how the body works. Okay? I mean, these things we calculated are relevant, but it, uh, this isn't how it works. Where's my towel? <laughs> I haven't thrown a hissy fit all year, but we're getting close. Let's see. I need my towel. Uh, God damn it. Ah! The towels are gone. I'm going to use this. I don't know what this is. This is like somebody's shawl that was left in there. Oh. I mean, it's this or nothing. What do you want me to do? I could try to blow it off, right? Okay. So where were we? That was too slow. So the way it really works then is cell membranes have ion channels. Oh, yes. Ion channels. <clears throat> so the cell membrane is not just a simple, basic, boring, passive device. Where if you think about it, there's really nothing, this really couldn't be how your body works because there's nothing specific biologically happening here. We're just talking about ions randomly diffusing their way across in a passive manner. Obviously, when a cell, uh, you know, when a, a neuron fires and sends information, it's a very specific thing happening. It's not just random things happening. So let's draw this. So here's an ion channel in the membrane. Kind of like that. So this represents the membrane. I'm not going to draw the lipids. No, I'm not going to. Um, and uh, there's these things you can sort of diagrammatically, I can't even do it now, diagrammatically uh, draw them like that. And this would be a closed ion channel. Right? So you have a bunch of things up here. Right, and you have a few ions down here, and you say this thing typically sits where you're at zero millivolts outside the cell and minus 70 millivolts inside the cell <clears throat> is your typical resting potential. And you can say, how do you even maintain that, right? I mean, it should be diffusing back across and going to zero. Well, there's other ion channels, and their job is just to maintain this difference. And then some ion channels, their job is to send a signal, right? So this ion channel is sitting here, it's closed, and it opens due to some, you know, signal molecule binding, molecule binding, that is binding, um, or a potential difference, a, a field applied. Like maybe one next to it just shot off and changed the potential. That would cause this one maybe to change this potential. And then it will open, oh yes, like this. 
little things come open like that. Right? And then ions can flow through and change the potential across the membrane right? and make it zero millivolts here, or maybe up to 40 millivolts there. Typical values. So the way you can send information on purpose is these ion channels open and close and adjust the concentrations of ions. Okay? There's millions of different ion channels. I'm not telling you the whole story, obviously, with different functions and respond to different things. And some of them use energy and actually pump ions across. Some of them just open and let ions flow. It's a whole field. This is about how well they understand it. Nobel Prizes, biochemistry, etc. Okay, That's my summary. Okay. Now, let's see if that's the key. Now, suddenly, everything will be great. And I can move my foot faster than 100 seconds. Let's see what this gets us. Because let's look at how a nerve cell really appears. Uh, let's see. So you've seen drawings of nerve cells probably before. Yeah, all these uh, articulated things like this. And then we'll zoom in on one. Uh, one axon here. All right, they just keep going. Uh, like that. Right, and you got a nucleus in it, neuron, axon, physicist, for, I'm a physicist, I don't care, okay, it's close enough. And there's little ion channels all along this axon. All right, all right, ion channels. All right, there we go. That looks exciting. Now, um, so what happens is uh, ion channels, um, open and close and stimulate other ion channels. This starts to sound like a Whitman poem. The ion channel stimulated me to open my duct and then the current flowed and then it was over. Um, and it's called an action potential. So you get basically get a little wave of potential flowing down. So if we were to plot it Potential like this, it's it's negative, it goes oh positive for a minute, and then it comes back down to negative. All right, so this is the potential versus really space or time. All right, I could be sitting in one place and I'd see, oh, that went by. Or I could just plot one in space at a certain time and say, oh, it's like that. It's a wave, right? The whole thing is moving like that. So this action potential is moved down the axon. Action potential. No, that is right. Action potentials. Move down the axon. So none of this I've explained with RC at all. <laughs> because this is beyond what we can explain with RC. The question is, how fast does an action potential go? Yes, how fast? That's potential. This is V. That's my cursive V. V is roughly one meter per second. All right. So an action potential on a typical axon lying around can go one meter per second. And for a lot of axons and neurons, that's all they do. But for the axon going from my brain to my foot, go, oh, I'm much faster, right? One meter per second, and I'm two meters tall, remember. Uh, it would take two seconds for a signal to get from my brain to my foot. So clearly, there must be yet more going on. OK, let's see what more. For some, action, you know, for some neurons, that's fast enough. But for some, you actually need to go even faster. So let's look then the final structure that we can look at that these things use. And we can think about the physics of it a teeny bit. And see what we get is that the um, is the body has figured out how to insulate sections of the axon with I guess you don't need to know this with myelin some molecule that surrounds it but it leaves uh, gaps for ion channels. And we'll see how that helps us. Ion channels. Oh, I gotta rest. Okay, I'm tired. Let's see. So it looks something like this. Um, here you've got your axon going along, and instead of just having uniform ion channels, it's got big regions that are insulated like this. Uh, I'm not giving you all the fancy biological words because I don't know how to pronounce them. Okay, here we go. Like that. So big myelin sheath. And then it just puts the ion channels like here. 
in between. So it sort of localizes them like that. Exciting. So what really happens is <coughs> here you have to wait for RC here in the gap, right? But then the current just flows down the axon. So if we want to think about it, and there's a little bit of physical connection here, is we said this circuit is slow. Right? So why is this circuit slow? This circuit is slow because no current ever flowed down this circuit. No current ever crossed that gap. The whole circuit is all about charging the capacitor up and discharging the capacitor. We don't actually have any like current flow. And that's why it takes a long time. So when we're talking about these ion channels, it's already a little bit different. Right? Clearly, there is current flow through the capacitor. It's getting in. But the idea is you have to get charged to the surface for that to even happen. So that's how we say this RC idea is still relevant to these parts. But once the current is in, it's just flowing down a wire here. It's just ions flowing down a wire. It's not limited by any capacitance. There's no capacitance effect at all. It's just like a wire with electrons flowing down it. And that speed is very high. Okay? So if you start Googling how fast is electricity, you get all these crazy weird answers, because there's two answers to that question. <laughs> One is how fast are the charge carriers moving? <clears throat> that's pretty slow. That's like an inch per second or something. The charge carriers, kind of dr the drift velocity that you learned about is pretty slow. But you don't have to wait for a drifting charge carrier to tell you how fast a signal goes. Like as soon as this charge carrier starts drifting, this one starts drifting, because they're all feeling the electric field. And electric fields propagate at the speed of light, which is very fast. Okay? So the information in a current flow goes not at the speed of light, but very fast. The little individual things just drift at sort of centimeter per second. But the current in that sense, the current in the information sense, is extremely fast. So you wait for an RC here. You've got to get enough charge built up to trigger the ion channel. So you've got to wait RC, but then the current flies through. And then you wait RC again, and the current flies through. Okay? So this cuts down uh, the time in two ways. So speeds up for two reasons. One is the capacitance is smaller now. So what property of the capacitor did we change to lower its capacitance? We changed A. Damn it, I don't have it here. <laughs> In this uh, big thing we were drawing, we were drawing this big uh, thing and said, what's the capacitance? <clears throat> well, we had the area and the D, right? But we made it area. We're just talking about a little gap now. We're not talking about the whole surface of a cell, of the whole axon. We're talking about this teeny little gap in here, epsilon naught A over D. So we dropped the capacitance to like one picofarad if we ran the numbers. Right? The resistance now, we're not going to calculate this, but also we're not thinking about the resistance through the whole membrane. We're thinking effectively the resistance through the ion channel, which is sort of similar to what we got before, so roughly 25 mega ohms, something like that. So now our RC is uh, more like 40 microseconds. Okay. So by localizing the place where the RC has to happen, one thing, that's one way we speed it up. But that's not all, right? So if we just do that and you just localize it all the way down, then you'd have to do it more times and you wouldn't gain anything. Right? But we gain things because we also jump these gaps. Right? So C is smaller, RC is smaller, but then the, uh, the, the, uh, the insulators are up to a millimeter long. Okay. So we don't have to do the RC near as often. Up here, it was every spacing that you have a, you know, an ion channel. You're technically going, waiting for the RC time constant, or every, the size of every cell. Here, it's only every millimeter you have to do an RC time constant. So now, finally, <clears throat> we can run the numbers. If I'm two meters tall, and these are spaced, I'll just do it by words. Let's see, they're two meters tall, and I'm, sp uh, I'm two meters tall. And one of these occurs every millimeter. There's 2,000 of them. And if there's 2,000 of them times 40 microseconds, what do you get? You get 80 milliseconds. And that's like a reasonable time it takes to get like from your brain to your foot. If it's 80 milliseconds, I can live with that. Okay? It's probably faster or slower. It depends on what you've been doing. I don't know the number, but it's milliseconds, I think. I don't think it's seconds. I know it's not seconds. I doubt it's microseconds. We should measure it sometime. Let's get a needle and a blindfold and a foot. No, that's not. Oh, wait, no, that wouldn't work. I don't know. We need some, some combination of those things. We need five cows and a battery. Okay. Okay, so that was bioelectricity. That was a physics version introduction uh, to bioelectricity. So we'll take our break, <coughs> and we'll talk about the magnetic field.
Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you the fields. You ready? Here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics of the magnetic field. All I'm going to do is give you the big picture. By the end of this, you're going to say, dude, I am ready to learn about the magnetic field now. If you're me, that's what you would say. You can say it your own way. Um, here's, but okay, so most magnetic field discussions start out with compasses and Columbus and something, I don't know, okay? But we're going to talk about uh, a bigger picture of what is going on with the magnetic field. And here is it is. Here, here's, here's it is. B is just like E, but for moving charges. Okay, that's the basic idea for moving charges. What does that mean? Here's something you'd need to know for the exam. A big charge right there. Remember the big charge is the one that doesn't go anywhere. It makes things. A big charge. Charge, what does it do? It creates something E field, right? Charge creates an E that pushes charge, that pushes charge. All right, so if we have another charge here, it feels a force F. That's just the basic thing that we've talked about. Two charges push on each other, and we like to say that uh, what it's really doing is the first one's creating a field for the second one. Let's see. A few quick answers. One is, it was supposed to be 25 milliseconds for the time constant. I don't know, I messed up. Can we have a practice exam, please? I'm looking for one. I'm going to try to find one. Might even be one from this class in this university. Or I may just go online and put physics practice exam <laughs> and just post whatever I find. No, I won't do that. OK, that's how the E-field works. So that should be familiar to you, right? OK, now, this is like the normal type A good student here. So I know a lot of you have a, a sibling. And you always ask this awkward question, so is your, is your sibling coming to Rice? And someone's like, oh, yeah. Some people are like, yeah, well, you know, they're sort of their own free spirit. They're on their own path, you know. So you're the good person that does normal things, OK? You're here. You're the electric field. Your sibling is the magnetic field, OK? So the idea here is that Q uh, is, has to be moving, right? They can never sit still, right? They're always just, they can't. A moving charge, a moving charge creates a magnetic field that pushes, that's an H, a moving charge. So the only difference between these two definitions is I've used the word moving, right? Yeah, it's the exact same thing. It's just that here, these things are sitting still. This pushes on that. Here, this charge has to be moving. And if it's moving, it creates a B field. And if you have a charge sitting here, it might feel a force. That charge would feel no force. Why? Because it's not moving. Everything has to be moving. So you say, well, if this one is moving, then it might feel a force that way. Right? None of these directions are correct. Okay? I'm just, we'll get into the directions in painful detail later. I'm just giving you the idea. All right. So maybe you're actually, you know, maybe your spouse or your sibling is highly accomplished. Some of you might be on this side. I don't know. Okay, but this field is just weird. Everything has to be moving. Okay, so now let's think about this. What if this, I forgot my Teflon rod. Let's just shrink things down for a minute. Everybody get small. Here's my Teflon rod. I'm rubbing it with the cat fur. It's charged. Look at that. Now, if I put my Teflon, charged Teflon rod right there, and if I'm a test charge, I feel a force and I see an electric field. All you guys see the electric field being created by that charged rod, right? See an electric field. Do you see a magnetic field? No, because it's not moving, right? Now, what about me? What if I go into high school marching mode here? Now I'm moving very smoothly here. Let me glide step this thing. If I look at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a magnetic field because it's a moving charge, right? Of course there's a magnetic field. Hey, I just switched directions because I see a moving charge and I see a magnetic field. Do you see a magnetic field? No. Well, what's going on? Hmm, so is there a magnetic field or not? Well, whether or not there's a magnetic field depends on your frame of reference. Okay, so just to tell you also how weird the magnetic field is, is it chooses to appear or disappear depending not only how it's moving, but how fast the observer's moving, which is weird. 
So this is like how relativity got started. So all I'm asking is that you be as smart as Einstein. Okay, I'm not asking much, okay? But if you ever read a little bit about relativity or just the Wikipedia page or watch some fun video, it's always about rods getting longer on a train, blah, 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 Whitman, whatever. But it's really what he was thinking about was this. This is the exact problem that Einstein was confused about that helped him figure out relativity. This is the original relativity paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. He's trying to understand why is it that in one frame of reference, your frame, you see no magnetic field, and in my frame, I do see a magnetic field. It's weird, because a magnetic field is weird, because fields are weird, because field theory is hard. Okay? I just want you to know that there's, if this gets confusing and weird, it's okay. Like, nobody figured it out until 1905, and it was some patent guy. I'll give a lot of money to see a patent lawyer uh, revolutionize physics these days. I would, <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Okay, so the field, but that's the fundamental, it has to do with motion. Okay, you don't have to do relativity. We're not going to think too much about the motion, but this is the, but really deep down, even though we describe it as totally different, it's really all it is, is everything's moving. The source is moving, and the thing feeling the force is moving. That's the only difference. Okay? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about then more useful, like how to visualize it and what it looks like and things like that. So the other weird thing about the magnetic field is that it's all based on dipoles, okay? Magnetic field based on dipoles. So speaking of things you might need to know for the exam, let's look at an electric dipole. We didn't do too much, but I think we did a little bit on electric dipole, and that was just all that is, is you have a positive charge and a negative charge, and they're like attached with a stick. That's all it was. So say we had a uniform field. Oh, we didn't do field lines. Oh. Say you have a uniform field pointing to the right. There's your uniform electric field pointing to the right. We only talked about two fundamental field geometries for the exam. One is the uniform field, and one is the field coming off of a point charge. Let's put a dipole in it. So the dipole really just met here is a positive charge like this, and there's like a stick that holds them at a constant separation, and there's a negative charge like that. And it's fun to think about, what is the force on this thing? And we went through this, the net force on this thing is zero, right? This one feels a force this way, and this one feels a force this way. And if you think of it as a single object and do the sum of the forces, sum of the forces is zero. But if you uh, think about the torque, it does feel a torque. So the force, what's the word total or net? The net force is zero, but the torque is not zero. It's uh, the dipole moment times the E times the sine of theta or whatever. It'll be on the PE sine theta. So the torque you get, actually, though, it depends on the angle. If you pull it all the way this way aligned with the field, the torque is zero, right? Because the force is the same direction as the little R vector to get the torque. If you have it 90 degrees, the torque is maximum. Right? So the torque you get depends on the angle. So you think, oh, that's kind of annoying. I prefer just plain charges. I don't like dipoles. Well, magnetic field is only dipoles. I hate to break it to you. So let's look at the magnetic dipole here. Magnetic dipole. So again, we'll imagine we have a uniform magnetic field pointing to the right. For now, we don't know how to make that, but don't worry about it. Uniform B field. Must be made by some moving charge somewhere. And uh, we draw the dipole, but for a magnet, we draw the dipole like this for historical reasons. We don't call it plus and minus, we call it north and south, right? And it's actually the same thing. Uh, that north, south, that dipole moment, or that dipole, will not feel a net force. F net will be zero. Okay? Uh, but the torque, it will feel a torque. And we'll get to the equations later. It's mu b sine theta. Basically the same idea. Mu, and we'll get to later. We're just doing ideas now. Mu is a magnetic dipole moment. B is b, and sine theta is sine theta. Okay. So you might say, now the book does do this, and some people like to do this, is you can kind of pretend that the north pole is like a positive charge, and the south pole is like a negative charge. So you can kind of say, well, it's kind of like this end is feeling a force that way, and that end is feeling a force that way. Kind of. But you'll never see anybody write an equation like this. I'll write it real fast, and I'll erase it, okay? Because I don't want to get in trouble. 
Are there any other faculty members here? Dr. Stenson, close your eyes. Right, you could say the magnetic force is the North Pole times B. Oh my God, don't ever write that, don't ever write that. Because it can actually never happen, okay? You can use this idea to kind of think about it. This one pushes along that way, that one along that way. But really there are no individual forces, there's only torques. And the reason there's no individual forces is because you can never get an individual dipole moment, okay? So first let's look at why is this called north and south real quick. It's because this obviously this is how a compass works. This is usually how magnetism is introduced as you think about a compass. I have a compass here. This is a very inconvenient compass to use because you spill water as you use it. But basically it's got a magnet right here, right? So that's like one of these really strong neodymium magnets that you aren't supposed to let kids play with. And I've got it on something that will float in water and uh, these things are always on water just because that lets it really free to go. But you can see, I put googly eyes on it to make it kind of creepy, right? So it's like, oh, look at these students. No, I want to look at that student right there, right? No, 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 let's look over here. No, I must look over there. <laughs> it's like the creepy person at the party. No, look, look, let's go get a drink over here. Let's go to the refreshment. Oh, no, no, must look that way. Okay, so what that is, ah, is uh, this thing is feeling a torque and trying to align with the field like that. So what's happening here is this thing has a dipole moment, like going between the eyes this way, and it's aligning with the magnetic field of the Earth, right? So the magnetic field of the Earth is going that way. Rice is crooked. If you've looked at a map, right, this is not north. When you point to Rice Boulevard, Rice is kind of messed up. So this way is north in this room, clearly, right? That way is north. Uh, the other interesting thing about that is that the Earth is upside down. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but uh, the Earth is the wrong way. Okay, so, so if we were to say here's the Earth and here's the North Pole and here's the South Pole, so Santa Claus is up here, right, and the penguins are down here. That's the North Pole, South Pole. If we were to put, look at the magnet inside the Earth, this is the South Pole, this is the North Pole, because that's what it takes for the magnetic field to go that way outside the Earth. Okay, and a lot of people don't know this because if you look up what is magnetic north? They just start saying, well, it's this thing. It's not exactly where Santa Claus lives. It's a little bit to the side. They say, this is magnetic north. No, magnetic north is down here. The actual dipole in the Earth, however this is made, that no one really know, and it's going to stop, we're all going to die, uh, is actually upside down. Because we think about the field outside the Earth. Okay. But that's really fundamentally what's happening, is that this magnetic object is aligning with the Earth's field. That's the way they first discovered it, basically. Um, so then you could say, well, okay, if we want to do this like we do electrostatics, why don't we just cut it in half? Okay, so let's try that. Let's see what happens when we cut it in half. Okay. And then we'll see why it's also messed up. Okay. You can't make a magnetic charge, or you might use the phrase monopole, the equivalent of a charge in electrostatics. So if you have your little north-south here, uh, you can say, well, I know, I'll just cut it in half. All right, that's not hard. <laughs> Break it. Uh, oh, I broke it. Look how damaged it is. Look at that. Oh, wow. North, still south, and this becomes south, and that becomes north. And you say, oh, well, that's too big. So I'll break it again. Here we go. Uh, uh, break it again. Now both ends are broken. Handle it carefully. Be careful. This is north, and now this is south. And that becomes north, and that becomes south. Okay, break it again. Da -da 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 -da. North, south, break it again. Da -da -da -da. North, south, right. As you keep breaking it, you always get a north and a south. You'll never get just, um, oh, I wrote ad infinitum there. You'll never get it down to just a north that you can treat as a charge. You'll always get it down to north and south. And the reason is because magnetism in materials comes from current loops, atomic current loops, in the sort of incorrect non-quantum classical sense the electrons are going around in a circle, you call that a current loop. And uh, that's what you get. Because what we say, we said the magnetic field is due to charge that is moving. So inside the material, you've got a charge that is moving. So let's look at the atom then, like the iron atom here. We've got a nucleus here. We've got electrons going around. And there's your current loop. The electron is going around the nucleus. 
So can you cut that in half? Well, you could take half the electrons off and half the electrons here, cut the atom in half, nuclear reaction, something crazy happens, and you got half an atom. But it's still got an electron going around in a circle. And you can keep cutting it in half till you have one electron going in a circle, and you can't cut that in half. Right? So basically a current loop uh, fundamentally creates a north and a south pole, effectively. A single electron going in a circle is sort of the ultimate limit of a little magnetic dipole that we're going to talk about, and you can't cut it in half. Right? It's impossible. So that's why you can never get um, a magnetic monopole. Or can you? Okay, so there was this one guy. I knew this guy in 1982. I'm telling you. No, seriously. Um, so uh, in the 80s, superconducting technology became available. And uh, in principle, there should be magnetic monopoles. So if we talk about, instead of talking about big macroscopic current loops, we talk about fundamental particles of the universe. There's no reason they couldn't, there couldn't be a magnetic moment or a, a magnetic monopole. And lots of cosmological theories will predict that, yeah, there probably is magnetic monopoles out there. We just haven't seen them because they're hard to detect or whatever. So if they're hard to detect, you need a superconducting wire, like a big superconducting loop. And if a magnetic monopole goes through a superconducting loop, it would give a very specific kind of a signature signal. So superconducting wire became easily available to labs in the early 80s. So uh, this one guy, Blas Cabrera, uh, at Stanford, who was an assistant professor and needed to get tenure at Stanford, uh, decided he was going to detect magnetic monopoles. So he set up this big careful thing with a loop and cooled it down and all the electronics, and he looked at all the systematic errors, and he was an expert at sensitive measurement. He really knew what he was doing, Blas Cabrera. He turns the thing on, and on Valentine's Day um, in uh, 1982, he gets a perfect signature of a magnetic monopole. Right, it was the happiest a physicist has ever been on Valentine's Day in the history of the world. Just, it's, and it's referred to as the Valentine's Day monopole. He sees this thing, very excited. It's like, let's see another one. And he watches, and another one. It's also like a physicist on Valentine's Day. And then another one, and nothing, and nothing, and nothing. And he watched it for 151 days and never saw another one. And what do you do? You publish. <laughs> it's like, well, we saw one. Well, let's publish it. So he published it in Physical Review Letters. It didn't take 151 days. In a few days, the whole world was buying loops of semiconductor or of superconducting wire. Like my dad was an insurance salesman, and he came home with some superconducting wire. He's like, hey, let's discover a magnetic monopole, right? Because three people get the Nobel Prize, and there's Blas Cabrera. There's two more people. He didn't really do that. <laughs> um, so everybody's setting up magnetic monopole detectors, superconducting wire, and no one's seen one ever since 1982. So they probably don't exist. Or if you're kind of romantic, you could say there's one that exists. And it flew through Stanford on February 14th, 1982. Now, there are people who do these. There are people that search for things that almost certainly don't exist in science. It's like a common thing a lot of physicists do. There are entire government-funded collaborations searching for things that almost certainly don't exist. And you might say, what a waste of time, right? Why would they bother to do that? Uh, and the reason is, even though they're not going to find it, by showing how low of a chance there is of seeing one, that contributes to science. Because the crazy, cos I'm sorry, the cosmologists write all these models of like how the universe started, and they write a model, and their model predicts that there should be a certain density of magnetic monopoles in the universe. And they can put a number on it. They should say it should have a certain cross-section per centimeter squared per second per stair radian. And if their model says this number, but Blas Cabrera said, I measured it, it's down here. Well, that model's no good. Let's make another model. Right? So they say, okay, now it's down here. Well, another person measured even more sensitive, and they said there's not any down to this level. Like, okay, let's make another model. Right? So when you measure, the, if you prove something doesn't exist to higher and higher uh, uh, precision, uh, basically that helps the cosmologists say, okay, we really must not have any down to this level. So it actually does contribute to science to just measure, look for something that doesn't exist, because you're proving more and more how few of them there must be uh, in the universe. But we know deep down they're secretly, they're secretly thinking... I'll find the one, right? And that's what Blas Cabrera thought, and he almost did. But then he didn't. And that's life. That's like how it goes. Okay. Okay, so that was a little intro into the magnetic field. Let me just read you off a few bullet points to remember. The last thing that I'll tell you about the magnetic field, just to get us ready to think about it on Thursday, is so summary. Or this is sort of a new thing. This is getting to your, your sibling. The B field is loopy. Okay, that's the last thing I want to tell you, is we're going to talk about how a straight wire with current the B field goes around it like this. Everything about the B field is curved. If you have a curved wire like this going around, the B field makes little loops around the wire like that. 
And here's the big one. If you have a uniform magnetic field like this, you say, finally, something straight with a magnetic field. And you put a charge in it. What's the force on the charge? Zero. I haven't made it move yet. OK, now if we make the thing move with some V, some charge Q, how do you think it moves? It moves in a circle. V, hold, give me a minute here. V, oh, shit, it's in the plane of the board. It's going to move in a circle in the plane of the board like that. And if you make it drift, it'll make a spiral. Okay? So everything about the magnetic field is all loops and curves, and that makes the math harder to do. That's why we're not going to write a Coulomb's law for the force of a magnetic field. Right? We have to get into gradients and loops and vector uh, field theory. But we'll still have plenty of formulas about how to calculate magnetic fields, how to calculate the forces and the radius of the circle. But the detail is never done as detailed as the electric field just because of that problem. Okay? So let's just stop there. That's enough intro of the magnetic field. Okay, so more info will be coming about the exam. All the emails in my inbox I haven't answered. I'm going to answer practice exams, solution things, it'll all come out.